Today, I want to tell you a story. But first, I want to start by asking you a question. If I was to say, name me a software house that produced great computer games back in the 80s and 90s, I'm sure you would have your own favourites. But would you say Accolade? Well, I think you should, because Accolade produced and released some of the most iconic games of the time and spanned both the 8-bit and the 16-bit era. But before I get started, I just want to say that if you are new to the channel, please remember to like and subscribe to see future content. So, I think we need to go back to the beginning. The year is 1977 and a young Miller and Whitehead joined Atari early in the year after graduating university. Miller at Berkeley and Whitehead at San Jose State. Attention shoppers, the new Atari cartridge game is in. Excuse me. Uh oh, George again. Atari's air feedback. It comes with 27 games, but that's just for starters. You can get nine cartridges, 187 Ooh, games. Blackjack. <laughs> oh. I'd like an Atari. Sorry, only our demonstrators left. Mine. No, George. Mine. The new video computer system by Atari. <laughs> more games, more fun. They were amongst the first developers employed to program for the VCS 2600 that would be released later that year. Along with David Crane, Larry Kaplan, they would become known as the Gang of Four. Three out of this world games from Atari, the number one video computer system with more games than any other. Everyone's gone Atari, Atari. the number one video game. However, it wasn't too long until Alan Miller wanted to gain credit for game design work that he had already done, and looked into how he could achieve this by looking at other industries. He did his research and drafted up a contract that would allow him to receive credit for work that he had done and receive a modest royalty at the same time. After he presented his idea to the Atari management, he advised the rest of the Gang of Four and it was at this point that all four were now seeking recognition for work they had done. It was initially thought they would be able to gain some sort of agreement and gain credit for games that they had worked on. However, they were eventually declined. This led to the Gang of Four getting disillusioned. Now this is something they felt was important. In fact, they felt it was that important that they left Atari. And by October, Miller, Whitehead, Kaplan and Crane, along with music executive Jim Levy, were on their way to starting their new adventure. 1981 was a year of explosive growth for the video game industry as a whole, and for one company in particular, Activision, bringing you the most creative and original home video games with extraordinary graphics, exciting sound, and incredibly realistic action. Just what you've come to expect from Activision. Here's why. What I really try to do in my video games is to bring the player onto the screen, to put him into the game, to help him experience the thrill of the sport or the challenge, make them feel like they're part of the game, that they're in the game. I enjoy people enjoying themselves. I think that's what it comes down to. I think what turns me on mostly in game programming is the unique combination of technical skills and creative juices. To combine those things, I really enjoy that. Activision would give credit to game designers where Atari didn't and push the designers to the forefront as opposed to a more corporate approach of Atari. Activision saw massive success with games such as Pitfall, River Raid, Kaboom and Chopper Command, the list goes on and on. However, at the time of Activision's conception, it was unusual for third party companies to make games as most games were made in-house by the makers of the consoles themselves. It's heavy! I found a way to the gold! Pitfall by Activision? Quick, to the Atari video computer system! Uh, here, show us. 
first. Yes. Climb down the underground passage. Oh, yeah. Leap over scorpions. Oh. I said. Yes. Now swing over the swamp crocodile. Yes. There. The gold. Oh. <laughs> Did I mention the tar pits? <laughs> A jungle adventure game designed by David Crane from Activision. This is where Jim Levy comes in. Levy was introduced to Miller and Whitehead by their lawyers and was a music executive with venture capital experience. This was vital to ensure the early success of Activision and fortunately for the talented duo he saw potential in their business idea. So with their raised venture capital and with help from a substantial personal financial commitment, Activision was on its way. Unfortunately for Activision, it wasn't too long before Atari had the new company in their sights. Atari sued Activision, charging them with trademark violations and theft of trade secrets. Atari's efforts were relentless and eventually tried to sue Activision three times, but in the end, Activision had nothing to show for it. Partially, due to the fact that Atari's actions were seen as nothing more than a tactic of harassment, in addition to the fact that Miller and Whitehead, along with the rest of the Gang of Four, had done their homework and checked everything with their attorneys and investors before starting Activision. The first game that Activision released was Dragster, programmed by David Crane, a single-player racing game. This marked the start of a steady stream of titles for the Atari VCS and by 1982 Activision had started releasing games for other platforms such as the Intellivision and Magnavox as well as home computers such as the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64 which were new to the market at this time. Activision challenges you to the video games of your life. Designed for your Atari video computer system. Demanding all your speed, strategy, and skills. So amazingly real, you'll believe Activision puts you in the game. Miller and Whitehead continued their success at Activision over the next couple of years. Mainly, but not exclusively, on the popular Atari platform. And whilst Activision was definitely on the crest of a wave of success which eventually saw the company go public in 1983 and raised over $140 million, it wasn't long before our famed programming duo was started again to feel a little dissatisfaction with the direction that Activision were going. They thought that the company lacked diversity and had identified home computers as an important growing market. When it became clear that Activision weren't interested in putting greater focus into the home computer market, they decided again to be on their way. So in 1984, Alan Miller and Bob Whitehead founded Accolade, and using their wealth of knowledge and experience gained whilst at Atari and Activision, along with their own money, they set to work with their newest venture. What could possibly go wrong? After knuckling down, Accolade's first game to be programmed and released in-house was Law of the West in 1985 for the Commodore 64 and Apple II. Although the first games they published were Sundog Trolls and Legacy for the Apple II, as well as the Dam Busters on the Commodore 64 and ColecoVision. Law of the West though was designed by Alan Miller and was the only game he worked on before taking up a management position and becoming CEO. The game itself is a type of graphical adventure and lets you take the role of a sheriff in a small town in the Wild West. The aim of the game is to make it through to Sunset Alive and along the way upholding the law by running drifters out of town, stopping local gangs from robbing the bank. You can even romance the ladies. The game was, in my opinion, ahead of its time due to its open approach and the consequences you have to accept depending on the decisions you make. For example, treat people the wrong way and they may shoot you. Furthermore, if you shoot too many people in town, well, then the doctor may not be as willing to help you if you get shot. The game's got a healthy 78% on Zap64, although they commented on the game's lack of replay value. All in all though, this was a good start for Accolade. In the same year, 
Accolade release Hardball. This was released on various home computers including the Commodore 64, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, Apple II and Amstrad CPC. Later the game would be released on 16-bit computers such as the Atari ST, Amiga and the Apple Macintosh to name but a few. The game itself was this time designed by Bob Whitehead, one of only two games that he developed before taking up a vice president position within Accolade. Hardball proved to be one of Accolade's most popular games and spawned a franchise and sold over 250,000 copies by the end of 1987. By 1986, Accolade's success had seen the company's revenue grow to $5 million and saw a shift towards publishing with the release of PSI Trading Company. The game was developed by DSI or Distinctive Software Inc and released on the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC and Apple II. It's essentially a space adventure strategy game where you must select your crew and transport your valuable cargo and survive the pirate infested universe. The game gained positive reviews across all platforms with the Commodore 64 version particularly praised for its music from its SID chip. 1986 also saw the release of Ace of Aces, a World War II flight sim that was released on various 8-bit computers. The game sees you take control of a British RAF Mosquito. The primary aim of the game is to attack various enemy ground targets such as trains, U-boats, as well as shooting down flying bombs and fending off fighters. The game received mixed reviews by critics. Your Sinclair magazine criticised the game's difficulty and stated that the game only had a few days worth of gameplay. However, despite some reviewers' criticisms, the game went on to be one of Accolade's best sellers. By the time 1987 came along, Accolade had enjoyed success across various genres of games and it was only so long before they widened their horizons even further. That same year, Accolade released the iconic game Test Drive on both 8-bit and 16-bit computers and was an instant success. The game gained positive reviews across the board. Computer Gaming World said that Test Drive offers outstanding graphics and the potential to hook every pole position fan. The game is a simple idea, take a modern supercar and drive through winding cliffside roads avoiding cars coming the other way and you can even try and outrun the police and it was not like that. The graphics were outstanding for the time with the 16-bit Amiga and Atari ST versions looking particularly impressive. 1987 also saw the release of The Train Escape to Normandy. The game sees you take the role of a train hijacker with the aim to escape Nazi Germany by driving the steam train. The game is a clever concept as it's not just a game where you have to shoot your way out. You literally have to take control of a steam train in addition to defending it. Released on the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum and other 8-bit platforms, the game got really good reviews despite some people thinking the graphics weren't up to spec. Personally. This game was one of my favourites. Even after completing the game, I found myself playing it again and again, which is a true sign of a good game. Test Drive 2 The Duel was released and a franchise was born. Test Drive 2 is more suited to the 16-bit machines and is a general improvement in all areas. In addition, the game also allowed you to drive additional cars from various decades and additional scenery with separate data discs being released. Supercars, Muscle Cars, California Challenge and European Challenge were all released as separate add-ons and proved very popular.
Unfortunately, 1990 would see Accolade take distinctive software to court over their conversion of OutRun to MS-DOS. Accolade sought a preliminary injunction against distribution and sale of OutRun. The case centred around the use of certain code and routines that were developed by distinctive software for the use in Test Drive 2. Accolade saw OutRun as an infringement of its copyright of Test Drive 2 The Duel. Distinctive didn't argue that certain codes and routines were used in the making of OutRun, however they argue that only standard libraries and routines were used to perform certain basic functions. Unfortunately for Accolade, the court rejected the claims and concluded that the licensing agreement transfers to Accolade the copyright of the concept and design of the video game but not the underlying source code. In the end, this case was settled on the language of the contract and could have been avoided if the contract had been worded differently. This wouldn't be the last time that Accolade was in court. In October 1991, the mighty Sega would file papers against Accolade on the grounds of copyright infringement as Accolade had released games on the Sega Genesis without a license, something that Sega didn't allow. Accolade tried to claim fair use, however, the court did not agree with its explanation since Accolade's work were for financial gain. The court ruled in Sega's favour and issued an injunction prohibiting future sales by Accolade of games on the Sega Genesis. Accolade would eventually appeal and saw Sega and Accolade ultimately settle in April 1993. As part of the settlement, Accolade became an official license of Sega. 1992 saw the release of Star Control 2 by Games for Bob. Released in November for MS-DOS along with being released for Apple OS as well as the 3DO, the game is a sequel to the 1990 Star Control game. Star Control 2 was released to critical acclaim and is regarded by some as being one of the best PC games ever made. The game is a story driven adventure, however, if I'm being honest, I can't really give my own opinion on this game as I've never played it. But the point that I want to make here is that this is one of the last big hits that they had. 1993 came along and was a mixed year for Accolade. They had success with Busby, scoring great reviews that helped make the game one of Accolade's biggest selling titles. The game was released for the Genesis, SNES and later on the PC. That same year though also saw the release of Speed Racer for MS-DOS. This game gained a negative review by critics and players alike, citing poor graphics, disappointing drivability, not to mention several bugs. The game itself was designed and released by Accolade. The game is based on the popular Japanese franchise of the same name. In 1996, the game was declared the 28th worst game of all time. 1994 saw co-founder Alan Miller called Time at Accolade and he left the company. Accolade's other co-founder, Bob Whitehead, had already left years earlier. The company was now making a conscious shift towards more sports-based games with average success over the next couple of years. 1997 saw the release of Test Drive 4. The game was programmed by Pitbull Syndicate, not DSi, who had made the previous titles. The game was made for the PlayStation and Windows. Despite only average reviews, the game sold well, probably based on the franchise's previous successes. This was definitely a title that was suffering from fatigue and was nowhere near as good as the games that it followed. The cars didn't look right, they didn't handle correctly, and the menus were basically annoying. Remember, by this time, the game had more competition from the likes of Need for Speed. The same year saw EA take over the distribution rights of all Accolade games. Accolade presents. 1999 saw the release of Redline. This would mark the end of an era as it was the last game published on the Accolade label. 
developed by Beyond Games and released for Windows in March, the game is a first person driving combat game that gained average reviews. The game is a million miles away from what had made Accolade great in the early 80s and by this time Accolade were in real trouble. Time was about to be called on Accolade. By the end of 1999 Accolade had been purchased by Infograms for 50 million dollars and renamed Infograms North America. This was the end of the road. So where are we now? Well. After Alan Miller left Accolade in 1994, he continued to work in the video games industry on various projects and even working with old Atari colleague David Crane at Skyworks Technologies for four years. As for Bob Whitehead, well he left Accolade soon after Hardball and left the games industry for good, deciding to spend more time with his family and getting non-profit religious startups off the ground. And in one final twist, the company that bought Accolade changed its names from Infograms to Atari, the company that Alan Miller and Bob Whitehead had left two decades earlier. However, this is not the end of the road for Accolade. Well, sort of. In 2017, Bill and Soft announced that they had acquired the Accolade label, and later that year released a new Busby sequel, thus allowing the Accolade name to live on. So this is where the rise and demise of the Accolade story comes to an end. On a personal note, I loved playing Accolade games back in the day. I had a particular soft spot for Test Drive. I remember reading a piece in a magazine and thinking that this looks so amazing. To my young eyes, at the time, it looked just like a professional driving simulator. Unfortunately for me, before the end of the week, my dad came home with Test Drive and tucked it under his arm. I couldn't believe that I had it in my possession. I also couldn't believe that I didn't wear the disc out because I played it to death. By the time Test Drive 2 came along, I'd already moved over to the Amiga and again, I played it to death along with their data disc add-ons. But what about you? Do you have any favourite Accolade games or do you have any Accolade memories? Let us know in the comments below. Once again, please remember to like and subscribe to see future content I would also like to say thank you to all my subscribers and followers as I really appreciate your support. It only remains for me to say thank you for watching Accolade, The Rise and Demise and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you very much and bye bye.